Um, I wanted to talk just briefly about the work. Aren't you happy it's going to be brief? <laughs> um, the first thing that always touches me or inspires me is the materials. And I have to, again, give honor to Michelle Wilkinson, who honed in on that extraordinary capacity for the raw materials themselves to speak. And I think it was extraordinary working with these women and seeing their work over the years. And of course, the artist world is a small one. Our universe, we begin to know each other. You know, our work evolves uh, in this, not in total isolation. And what was extraordinary was to see the depth and passion and extraordinary meticulousness that each one of these women worked, how they worked the materials. There is a level of knowing, a level of openness, a level, a level of being able to exact the spirit from a material, the simplest of materials. We're not talking something fancy and removed, but we've been drawn to very basic materials that spring up out of our living experience, that spring from our environment. And for me, the most powerful environment that always echoes in my spirit is the southern landscape. I was raised in the uh, foothills of the Blue Ridge Mountains in Virginia and with, by my grandparents. And that landscape has forever informed my work. My favorite thing to do in the country, in the rural south, was to play in the mud. So I began my career with the red clay of Virginia. And it informed me, it informed my work, it informed a, a level of passion for the ability to create something out of nothing along with the extraordinary community that I lived in, my grandparents, the extraordinary black community, people were self-sufficient. My grandfather was a farmer. The food we ate, he grew. He, you know, he worked the soil with his hands. My grandmother was a, a quilter and could bake and can and do all those things. So it was very familiar to me, the notion of making, the notion of having a sense of power, if you will, a sense of not only creating something for yourself, but for the larger community. So with that, playing in mud, my mother still teases me that I grew up and I still play in mud and play in with rocks. Uh, but there's something very primal, very basic, and very human about our need to gather onto us materials. And I'm sure if we check our memory, we all have a favorite stone, a favorite rock, a shell that we've gathered. And there's a reason that these materials call us. They speak to us. So the thing that speaks to me is clay and stone. Uh, and in these particular works that are here, I try to use small uh, elements. And I'm constantly working with the cumulative energy of a thing to start with something minute, something small, something intimate. And then at the same time, to expand the breadth of this material, to incorporate a larger narrative. And we know in our community, storytelling is a part of our lives. It's like the air we breathe. So my work is always based and underladen with a narrative, a story that I want to tell. And I'm going to speak first uh, about the piece that I'm standing right in front of, which is Scent of Magnolia. And it is constructed of uh, stone. And this stone is a very interesting, beautiful stone. And I have to say, when I see stone, I feel the complexity of time recorded in this material. Because the earth itself, in this volcanic action, this vulcus motion, has fired this material. It's clay, and it's been fired. It's now permanent. And then some of it predates history. I mean, it goes back to the times before the dinosaurs, during the dinosaurs, and the stone moves forward in time. So when I use these materials, I find it to be a way of encapsulating all of this energy, all of this time, all of this cumulative memory of the earth, if you will. So this stone is really formulated in 
coal mines when there are fires underground. And if you look closely, the materials themselves, it looks like um, pieces of bark. So in actuality, it's petrified pine wood that gets fired uh, in the coal mines. So it has still this memory of being wood, though it's stone. Uh, my work also, an important element for me is touch. And I know I'm in the museum looking at Andrew is doing cringe. <laughs> but I'm always the person in the museum, they go, ma'am, don't touch the artwork. You're too close. But there's something about the tactile quality that invites you in. I really want the piece to draw you in, to not only touch it visually with your eyes, but to somehow have your spirit, to have touch it, to run your hands over, to feel the typography of the pieces themselves. The narrative underlaying the scent of magnolia, I'm sure we're all familiar with Billie Holiday's um, Strange Fruit. Um, and I was working on a large scale public piece and there was a huge garden. And there was a magnificent magnolia tree there. And I gathered up some of the pods and just took them to my studio. And of course, as the pods began to uh, ripen and rot, they kind of spew forward this jewel-like red seeds. And I thought, oh, how magical, you know. And I'm a sculptor, and you know you can't even get anywhere close to the magnificence of what nature will yield for you. So I often take notes from that, from the structure of how something is done. So this notion of strange fruit. Um, and I wanted to encapsulate the kind of song and memory of that presence, and that these pod-like forms were ever-changing and morphing. And at the same time, these, they feel like plants, they feel like animals, I, they move back and forth between the possibilities of what they can be. And I almost imagine the red kind of gashes or inner uh, seeds become almost flesh-like that these have been somehow severed. And this is like a, a glass, Italian glass, that's cut into tiny little pieces of tessera and laid into the concrete. These are very solid, and these pieces are meant to be, they're beautiful here on this magnificent floor, but in a garden, in, a, in the landscape, just kind of strewn in the landscape, and they weather. So the longevity of materials become really important as well. And we know stone will outlast all of us. So there's something um, wonderful, something inviting to me about the notion of uh, building something that lasts. Um, when I began my career in terms of working in clay and uh, oftentimes you think of pottery, but I never really made pots. I was always making things like bricks and shapes and fragments of things. So the notion of the individual pieces become important. And it becomes really part of our tradition when I think about the quilting. And uh, when I think about when you look around the space at how many of the pieces are constructed, it's this cumulative energy that we speak with. There's a narrative of motion, of the repeated effort. Uh, and maybe women, we do that best. You know, you can get onto something and man, we don't let go of it until it is done. You know, so there is something about the rhythm of how we work and how we create and why we must continue and why you don't give up. You know, you just keep going. It's like, oh, one more stone, but you do it. You do it anyway. So there's something about that cumulative energy, that tenacity of spirit that I think is spoken of here in this room uh, with the materials that these women have meticulously selected. And I also feel that the materials also select you. You know, there's a reason why they speak to you. There's a reason why there's a voice that you, only you can hear at some moments. And I think also the diversity that you see in this room of materials, of visions, of um, how things are fabricated and why they're fabricated. There's an extraordinary breath present, um, but it speaks to all of us.